Hi, everyone. Welcome to Volcano Tuesdays. Thanks for joining us here live this Tuesday. My name is Gina Roberti, and I'm an educator with the Mount St. Helens Institute. We are a nonprofit organization that teaches about the science and stories of Mount St. Helens. And this online education series is designed to rouse your curiosity and questions about volcanoes. Volcano Tuesdays includes a live demonstration each week, as well as a set of challenges for you to do at home. We encourage you to take pictures of what you do and submit to us. We highlight what folks submit to us each week on our live series. I'm really excited this week to highlight a drawing that came in all the way from a town in Forks, Washington. So let's flip over and see what this drawing is. This was created by Kinder, and Kinder was drawing a volcano. You can see there's a rock slide on there and the standing dead trees. So Kinder did the challenge of drawing the landscape that was affected by the 1980 blast of Mount St. Helens. Wonderful job, Kinder. So last week we learned about how the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980 affected the landscape around it, affected the plants and animals that lived there. This week, we are going to focus a little bit more on the science of eruptions. Why do some volcanoes go kaboom? And why do others spew lava in a more gentle fashion? We're going to learn about the chemistry of the magma beneath the surface and how this affects the style of the eruption that we see on the surface. Today, we're going to do a couple of different experiments. You can follow along or pause the video at any time if you want to gather supplies and try the experiment on your own. Our challenges this week are for you to conduct these experiments and make these models on your own at your home and remember to share with us so we can highlight next week. Today we're going to learn about a big complicated word called viscosity which is the resistance of a substance to flow. Um, before we get started, I just want to, I need to take a sip of tea. So excuse me for a moment. Let me grab my, my tea mug over here. And I, my throat's a little sore from talking so much. So I'm also gonna get some honey, but I pulled this honey out of my um, kitchen cabinet and you can see that it's gonna be really difficult for it to come out of the jar smells good. It was local honey. Um, but as I'm holding the jar to pour it, nothing is coming out of the jar. Why is this honey so different? Thank goodness I have. I live with some other folks and I asked someone else for honey and they provided me with this honey here. This honey is able to flow a little bit more easily. And oh, thank goodness I'm able to get a little bit of honey into my mug here. Now our investigation today is why are some materials able to flow, like this honey? And why are other materials so much more resistant to flow? If I left this upside down for maybe a couple of days, the honey would come out. But right now, I would need a spoon to dig that honey out of there. So let's begin by looking at this complicated vocabulary word called viscosity. It's a long word. It begins with the letter V. It's a great word for Scrabble. Viscosity is the resistance of a material to flow. So to learn about viscosity, we're going to do a couple of experiments in my kitchen. The first one is going to be an experiment where we race materials with different viscosities and see what happens. So let's take a look at this race. Welcome to my kitchen. Here I have some peanut butter, creamy style. I'm going to take a tablespoon of this peanut butter and place it at the top of my tray. This tray is a baking sheet that is lightly greased and is tilted up at a relatively steep angle, maybe 45 degrees. Next, I'm going to take some honey. This honey is nice and runny. I'm going to measure out a similar amount to the peanut butter, approximately one tablespoon. Giving it a moment to flow out of the container I'm going to then place this honey next to the peanut butter on the baking sheet at the same height as where I placed the peanut butter. The purpose of this experiment is to race the two materials down the tray. The baking sheet is going to serve as our race track. Let's see which material moves more quickly. We can see the honey is already starting to flow quickly and the peanut butter has not moved very much. 
Peanut butter and honey are both materials that will flow, yet their ability to flow is different based on their structure and their composition. We call the ease at which a material can flow its viscosity. In this race, honey is less viscous, meaning it is easier for it to flow, and thus it is going to reach the finish line more quickly. I like to think about lava coming out of volcanoes in a similar way. Sometimes the lava is thick and sticky, like peanut butter. Maybe we could call this sticky like Jiffy, the Jiffy brand of peanut butter. And sometimes this lava is thin and runny, runny like honey. Let's label our two teams in this race, sticky like Jiffy, runny like honey, and remind ourselves who was the winner. Clearly the honey. Now here's a picture of what sticky like Jiffy lava actually looks like. This is lava erupting from the lava dome at Mount St. Helens. This picture was taken in 1981. Notice how thick and sticky the lava is coming out of the dome. In contrast, here is a picture of lava that is classically runny like honey. This is a picture of some lava photographed in Hawaii in 2018. Notice how the lava flows easily and makes textures similar to what we saw in the honey. Let's do another experiment in my kitchen to learn more about viscosity and how it works. Welcome to my kitchen. We just learned about viscosity, the resistance of a liquid to flow. Let's start off with this thin gravy made out of some chicken stock and butter. Notice how this gravy is thin and flows easily. Now we are going to change the composition of our gravy by adding flour. Let's mix in our flour. In this model, the flour represents the silica in our magma. Both flour and silica are components that add friction into our liquid mixture. The friction of the flour in our gravy and the silica and the magma rubbing against one another make it more difficult for both liquids to flow. We can see that our gravy is already thicker than when we started. Notice as well the size of the bubbles in our boiling gravy. As the gravy heats up, the water inside turns into water vapor and is released as steam. When this steam bubbles up and through, it causes the gravy to boil. Let's see what happens when we add even more flour. We are manipulating the viscosity of our gravy. We can see that our gravy becomes even thicker. Watch how the size of the bubbles when it boils also begin to change. As we add more flour, this makes it more difficult for the water vapor to escape as steam. The composition of the gravy itself can block the steam from escaping, causing big fat bubbles when it is boiling. If we can imagine this gravy as a magma, we can also imagine the difference in how explosive eruption may occur depending on the viscosity. Wow, we can see a big difference in the viscosity of that gravy from when we started to the end when we added all of the flour. Let's take a look at something really interesting, which is how scientists study volcanoes using aerial images, so images taken from the air, to look at the texture of the lava that's erupting from them. The difference in texture reflects difference in viscosities. Let's learn a little bit more. The difference in viscosity of magma in volcanoes results in a different style of eruption on the surface. We can see this when we look at volcanoes from a bird's eye view using satellite images in Google Earth. Let's take a look at Google Earth series called 10,000 Years of Volcanoes. The red pins on this map show the locations where volcanoes have erupted in the past 10,000 years. We will zoom in on the volcanoes of the Pacific Northwest. Here is Mount Hood, Mount Jefferson. We'll go north to find Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams, and Mount Rainier. We are going to travel south to look at a volcano in Northern California called Mount Shasta. Mount Shasta is part of the Cascades volcano chain, which includes many of the red dots we see in our view of the map. Mount Shasta is a tall cone-shaped stratovolcano, easily visible in our satellite view. 
When we zoom in on Mount Shasta, we can see the texture of various lava flows that have built up the edifice of the volcano during past eruptions. If we zoom in even further, we can see that the sides of the volcanoes have different textures. If we look at the texture of lava flows on the northeast side of the volcano, we'll notice that these flows look similar to the texture of the honey in our viscosity experiment. Notice the ropey texture of these flows. We can imagine this lava flowing down from the summit of Mount Shasta, down the steep sides, and making the same pattern as the honey did when flowing down our steep tray. What we are modeling in our kitchen helps us understand the behaviors of volcanoes in the real world. Scientists can deduce clues about volcanoes and how they have erupted in the past by using this satellite imagery. How does viscosity play a role in volcanoes? Let's talk a little bit about chemistry. Similarly to the flour in our experiment with the gravy, inside our magma underground, there are many different elements. The way that these elements bond together and then the abundance of these elements and the bonds forming crystalline structures can create more friction inside the magma, thus increasing the viscosity. One of the most common molecules that forms inside volcanoes is a molecule made up of two elements, silica and oxygen. These are two of the most abundant elements in the Earth's crust. Silica is a very tiny element that has a strong positive charge, and oxygen is a much larger element that has a negative charge. Positive and negative attract, and the elements bond together. Let's take a look at a picture to help us understand how these elements bond to form a silicon oxygen molecule. Here in this drawing, you can see the silica element is represented by a orange sphere. The sphere represents the charge around the element because the element itself, the atom, is very, very, very tiny. The silica is in the center. Around the silica, it is bonded to oxygens. The oxygens are represented by the blue spheres. A total of four oxygens bond to the silica. This is as many oxygens as can squeeze tightly around the silica. The oxygens are attracted to that positive charge of the silica. When all of these elements bond together, the shape that they make is very symmetrical. It forms a 3D pyramid shape, what we call a tetrahedron. When we take one silica and we bond it with four oxygens, we get one silica tetrahedron. Tetra means four, and this is because our tetrahedron is a three-dimensional pyramid or a triangle with four different faces. Today, we are going to build paper models of silica tetrahedrons. I have one here. To do this, you can use a worksheet that's on our website. This worksheet outlines the different uh, shapes that you need to cut out on a piece of paper and also gives you some information about silica and why it is cool and related to volcanoes. But you can also download this worksheet and do it later. You can also follow along with me today without the worksheet because I'm going to explain how to build your own paper silica tetrahedrons. To do this, you're going to need the following supplies. You're going to need some tape or glue, paper, it can be white paper or paper of different colors, a ruler, yarn or string, pencil or marker, and some scissors. Let's begin. Here, I'm going to begin by drawing an equilateral triangle. Each side of my triangle needs to measure to be the same distance. In my triangle, each side is going to be two inches long. I'm going to start with one triangle and then I'm going to draw another triangle on the side. I'm then going to draw another triangle to the side of that and a triangle underneath. This makes one large triangle with three smaller triangles inside. I'm going to add some small flaps on the sides and then cut out the entire shape. Then I'm going to fold each of the small triangles into the center around the center triangle. 
fold the small flaps in and piece together to build a three-dimensional structure of my silica tetrahedron. I can use some tape to tape the flaps together, which can be tricky. You can also use glue. And voila, we have a three-dimensional model representing a silica tetrahedron. Now, I'm going to use some other colored paper to build my garland, starting out with one triangle, then another, then two triangles on the side, making sure every side of my triangle is equal distance. In this case, all my triangles are going to be the same size, two inches on each side. Again, I'm going to fold the triangles into the center, fold the flaps, and we have little tetrahedrons starting to form. Starting with one triangle, then another, then the two triangles on the side. Now, this process of making the garland is taking some time, which is why I sped up this video so you wouldn't have to sit through the entire thing. Deep underground inside volcanoes, the process of forming minerals also takes a long time. This can take hundreds, thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of years to build mineral structures. It depends on what is inside the composition of the magma, but if there is an abundance of silica and oxygen, and these elements can travel to each other, then they will bond readily to form the tetrahedron. Silica and oxygen are two of the most abundant elements on the Earth's crust. And these tetrahedron form the basis of many minerals which we are familiar, quartz, feldspar, and others. Once I have all of my tetrahedron assembled, I'm going to string them up on a garland. This part can be a little tricky. I'm threading the string through. You can also use tape or glue. And eventually, when all of my tetrahedron are on the string, I have a little garland that I can hang behind me. So why is viscosity important to volcanoes? As we saw, Depending on the chemistry underground in the magma, this affects what type of eruption we have on the surface. At Mount Shasta, we saw that sometimes the lava flows come off the mountain and can flow a very far distance if they have a lower viscosity and are able to flow more like honey. If the magma is thicker and sticky, we saw in our flower experiment that sometimes that can cause the gases inside to get trapped and cause more violent explosions, which is what we saw at Mount St. Helens in 1980. So paying attention to viscosity is important to both understanding how volcanoes work and being a better able to predict how they might behave in the future to protect the people who live around them. We have two different challenges this week. The first challenge is to do a race. Like we did with the peanut butter and the honey, you can use whatever materials you can find at your house. If you have some honey, maybe honey of different viscosities, but set up a race, I used a cookie sheet um, and I put a little bit of oil on it so things would move a little more quickly. You can change the angle of your sheet and you can control all the different factors of your experiment. But play around with materials that you identify in your home that have different viscosities. You could even mix materials of different viscosities. You can try heating things up and seeing how that affects how easily materials flow. So that is challenge number one is conducting your own viscosity race. Challenge number two is to build your own silica tetrahedron model. Now, in this model, I used triangles that were two inches long, but you can build a much bigger model, making your, uh, the size of your triangles two feet long or even larger. You could build a huge silica tetrahedron, or you can build some little ones. Either way, try building one or try building multiple and make a garland like the one behind me and string it up in your homes. Take a picture of the things that you create and submit to us so we can share on our Volcano Tuesdays for next week. If you want help with building your model, remember that we have a link to a worksheet with a template that you can download and print to build your own three-dimensional models. I want to thank a special shout out to Moses and Rebecca for donating the beautiful colored paper that I used to create this garland. And also a thank you to all of the partners of the Mount St. Helens Institute that make Volcano Tuesdays possible. Many of the photographs and images that we share come from the US Geological Survey. 
um, which is an organization that conducts science, but also conducts, ex it does excellent outreach and education about volcanoes, and we are able to use those materials to teach. So thank you, USGS. Other partners of the Mount St. Helens Institute include the U.S. Forest Service and the Cowlitz Indian Tribe, as well as our amazing volunteers and supporters. Thank you so much for tuning into Volcano Tuesdays, and we look forward to seeing you next week.